Populism is a word that many have had a hard time defining. In the past four years, a renewed interest in the term has developed, and pundits and academics alike have thrown it around primarily as a scare tactic. This was partly due to Donald Trump campaigning on a populist appeal that rejected establishment politics, but also showed a fear of the popularity of figures like Bernie Sanders and populists around the world, both on the left and on the right. In some of the top political science programs at universities across the country, lots of work has been done to condemn populism as antithetical to the tenets of liberal democracy. And papers of record like the New York Times and Washington Post have published op-eds decrying populism as a gateway to authoritarianism and an attack on democratic norms and institutions. Because we cannot simply define populism as anything that criticizes the establishment, we should look towards American history in particular and ask ourselves, what is populism? The word populism was first used in the 1890s when the People's Party came into fruition as an agrarian third party that provided a left-wing alternative to the two-party system strengthening throughout the Gilded Age. Central to the populist platform were policies such as federal regulation of railroads and bimetallism, or the fixed rate of exchange between gold and silver. After the federal government adopted floating exchange rates to better fund the Civil War effort, farmers, debtors, and Westerners formed the short-lived Greenback Party that campaigned for an increased production of paper money backed by silver. When the market crashed in 1893, proponents for both gold and silver standards saw an opportunity to get the economy back on its feet. Against the establishment that saw the rise of the Gilded Age, Democrat Dark Horse candidate William Jennings Bryan made bimetallism and the unlimited coinage of silver central to his platform, arguing it would do much more for the common people than the gold standard that was proposed by his opponents. After the election of 1896, where the populists joined by a coalition led by Bryan lost to William McKinley, and the People's Party collapsed. In the years to come, former populists found themselves in both of the major parties, as well as smaller, unsuccessful, but historically important groups, such as Eugene V. Debs Socialist Party. Many of the populist ideas were also adopted by what became known as progressives, whose movement peaked with the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. In the 20th century, American populism became a much harder to define phenomenon. Perhaps the most interesting figure that can speak to our moment today was Louisiana Democrat Huey Long, who served as both governor and U.S. Senator before he was assassinated in 1935. Long appealed to a disenfranchised populace throughout the 20s and 30s in the wake of the Great Depression, who felt that FDR's New Deal did not go far enough in its redistribution of wealth. Long spent his time in office expanding social services and infrastructure projects but was criticized for corrupt associations and patronage appointments. Regardless of how he should be perceived, there is a clear lineage between his policy and rhetoric and that of the populist movement that collapsed decades before him. Long came from a poor background, but made a name for himself as a lawyer who took on large corporations. With the appeal of his unique passion and preacher-like wit that spoke directly to the material inequality of Louisiana, he ran a successful gubernatorial campaign in 1928. And in 1932, after a failed impeachment trial, he ascended to the Senate after suggesting his candidacy was a popular referendum on his platform. Long made significant progress in infrastructure development, education, and healthcare, and his Christian Baptist background was always central to his rhetoric. Long was a firm supporter of FDR's candidacy for president, but later criticized his New Deal from the left and instead proposed a grandiose program he called Share the Wealth that called for a strict wealth cap and inheritance tax. This led to tensions with FDR and the Democratic establishment in a time where political tensions as a whole were increasing around the world. Lots of critics saw his share of the wealth as controversial and socialist, but unlike the actual socialists and communists of his time who he debated, he emphasized the importance of private property and warned of the dangers of revolution. However, Long had frequent conflicts with the media and was often portrayed as a dictator because of his patronage networks, background dealings, and the way he pressured his opponents. Although many of his characteristics may not be favorable by traditional American political standards, there is no question that the establishment saw him as a threat. After the Great Depression and World War II, 
the specter of populism became distorted by racial tensions and the Red Scare with figures like Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace, and Richard Nixon. And the term no longer contained the economic prioritization that was once inherent to it. After the economic stagnation of the 1970s ushered in the neoliberal era and the Cold War slowly came to a close, it seemed that there was no place in politics for populist rhetoric, save for some smaller figures like Ross Perot. But after the 2008 crash was responded to by the energy of social movements like Occupy Wall Street and Tea Party protests, it was clear that establishment politicians could not properly address the issues facing the masses. In 2016, two figures on either side of the political spectrum rose to challenge that establishment that had become characterized by Wall Street bailouts and deep state gridlock, and the press quickly pointed out what they had in common. Populist rhetoric, or rhetoric that addresses the people versus the elites, us versus them, etc. Even if Trump wasn't able to properly govern like a populist from history would be expected to, his success is symptomatic of the failures of the neoliberal bipartisan consensus. If populism is antithetical to liberal democracy, perhaps we should look at it in a new light if we are to form a conception of politics that truly addresses the needs of all. I want to thank Liam Creaser today for writing this script, writing the essay that essentially is this video. Thank you, and I'll see you next time on the DC show. According to the tables which we have assembled, it is our estimate that 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America, and that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue? and would let one man take off the table what's intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat. The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. <laughs>